everyone. Welcome to another edition of Game Plan. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to come on. If you are new to the platform, this is a space where you can get some information from former, former and collegiate professional athletes about their game plan. And um, if you are a returning member, thank you so much for being part of the network. Uh, today's guest, we have Dr. Robert Turner. He's a, a former CFL player and NFL player, so he's going to come with a lot of great knowledge on your career paths. So please feel free to raise your hand um, by using the reaction function or post any question inside the um, chat box, and we'll try to definitely bring you on to ask questions. So Dr. Turner, the floor is yours, and thank you for participating. All right. Well, Thank you so very much, Mr. Smalls and uh, Dr. Miller. Thank you for having me here. And I just thank everybody for allowing me to, to be here. So since we have a small group and, and there's probably gonna be lots of other people who are listening and wanting to you know, hear us on once they chime in online, I'm gonna do this in a very kind of casual, informal way um, where you feel free to throw up your hand or put a question in the chat. And you know you can interrupt me along the way instead. I don't like to lecture. I don't like to spend 25 minutes in a classroom and you don't wanna hear me talk for 25 full home minutes, but I certainly will start the conversation. Hope we can have a great conversation. I'd love to know a little bit about you, spend, share some little, you know, the information that I've gone on my journey, some of the big issues that I deal with in my career right now. Um, so we'll just kind of go with it at that. So don't, don't feel like you have to wait until I give a talk before you can you know, chime in on questions, comments, and the whole bit. Deal? Can I get a thumbs up for those that see your picture? All right. And if you got the, you know, the emoji, give me a thumbs up, something like that. That's great. Thank you. All right. So I'll start kind of like from the very beginning. I'm originally from North New Jersey. Many of you probably, you're in New York. You're right there, right across the river. I grew up at a time um, it was literally during deindustrialization in Newark. Newark used to be a thriving, you know, kind of area where there's lots of, um, you know, lots of work. My, my parents, my grandparents originally from North Carolina and they came up in, um, I believe my grandmother, they came up in about 1920, the first wave of the great migration. My dad loves to tell a great story about uh, my grandparents, um, because my, both of my grandparents were, were um, from um, nine siblings in their, their family. And so they wanted to come up for a better opportunity. They were from, you know, really poor part, Tillery, small little town in North Carolina. So they took the train, like so many other people from North Carolina, they took the train coming up north. And so my, gra my grandmother had an uncle named Robert who lived in Harlem. And he told him to come up to New York and to get off at Grand Central, I mean, get off at Penn Station in New York. Well, my grandfather misunderstood what the train conductor said. And he said, the station is at Newark. And he thought he said New York. And so they got off. They didn't know anybody. They had no idea. But back in that day, literally, there were some other people from North Carolina. They ran into them and they said, do you need a job? And then my grandfather walked into a ball bearing plant and he worked and got a job. And that's how our whole family uh, wound up being in North. So it was a thriving place. But then I grew up at, during that time after the North riots, you know, deindustrialization, it was really, really rough. And I grew up in almost an all black community, right? Well, I say it was really all black and, and Hispanic. That because I used to I joke and tell people that um, for me, when I was young, very young, I thought the world was black. And the reason I thought that was because the only time I ever saw white people was when I was at church or when I was watching television. But otherwise, my whole universe was all black and brown folks, right? So my parents then moved us out to a place called Piscataway, New Jersey. Some of you may be familiar with it because it's where Rutgers is. And that was, again, all starting to be the time where, you know, you had desegregation, busing. I'm not that old, but, but literally, you know, black folks were moving from the inner city and moving out to the suburbs. Well, as you could imagine, there was a lot of strife. They did not want us there. It was really difficult. And as a young black man in junior high school, they labeled me as special education, special needs, right? So remedial programs. And so like so many other young, you know, um, black folks, in particular the black boys, you know, that was, I, you know, I, I was struggling against that through my whole academic career, right? And I was trying to figure out, well, why do these people are saying this about me? I know I'm smarter than that, but yet, 
Um, this is what they keep telling me about myself. And so from that, I actually wound up going back and not knowing this about myself until I went to graduate school years later um, to pursue a PhD in sociology. I realized that my way of getting along in and in, in, you know excelling in that environment, educationally, socially, and all this other stuff was to turn to sports. Right. And fortunately for me, on one hand, I happen to be a really superior athlete, good enough to win a scholarship to to, um, to college and then go on to play professional football. So I felt like that was the one area that people had high expectations for me that I could excel, that I was better than all the other white kids. And, I, you know, they couldn't keep me down. So, so, you know, I thought I pursued sports because I really loved it. And actually I did because I was a great athlete, but it was also a way to compensate for what I felt like people were saying about my academics, right? And so all the way through high school, I was a C student, nobody expected anything of me. So I didn't put any, you know, real effort into it or I put enough effort to earn a scholarship to college, right? And my parents, I was first generation, um, you know, college students, so my parents were always, saying to me, as long as you did your best, then we're going to be happy. Well, I let other people dictate what my best was and not really ever knowing what I could actually achieve had I really put a lot into it. Um, so after, so, and I was a, you know, like three, four star, um, sport athlete, baseball, basketball, football, track, you basically, I was just a very natural athlete. And so it worked out quite well for me. Um, but I had no idea, like, as an example, I, I didn't know how to pick a college. I had no idea. Um, and the, the, um, you know, the teachers and the, and the academic counselors, they were no, of no real value to me whatsoever. So, you know, I went, uh, and fortunately, I chose a school that wound up being very good for me. I went to James Madison University in Virginia, which isn't, you know, the biggest name football program in the world. And especially when I was there, their football program, I think it was, had only been eight years in the, in the making at that point. And I was one of the first one or two um, cohorts or classes that they recruited to, to play division one um, football. But the reason that I say that I was very fortuitous to go there is because I had scholarship offers to go to Penn State and some other schools. But when James Madison came and visited me and they talked to me and they were in my front home, you know, in my living room, they said, hey, listen, a lot of other schools really want you, but we need you. And so as a 17, 18 year old kid, I thought, well, that's exactly where I want to go. That was, you know, what I needed, and especially that affirmation. And they told me that I was going to be able to play a lot and that kind of stuff. And so um, that's where I chose to wind up going. And, and really, I was so fortunate in making that decision is because our coach, you know, being from up north, going to school down to the south, I was a little bit of a wild card, you know, coming out of New York City and all of that other stuff. And one day the coach sat me down in his room and he said, hey, listen, we really like you being here. We want you to be here, but you need to settle down. And then he also said to me, he said, you know, when you sat in that chair, do you remember? He said, are you trying to make me into a liar? And I said, what do you mean, coach? And he said, well, you sat in that chair, your parents sat in those two chairs, and I promised your parents you were going to graduate from college. And he goes, don't make me a liar. Right. And so that was enough to, you know, really put into me. But and I did OK in school. I was another a C, maybe a C plus student. But again, no one in school. And I write about this. I haven't mentioned it, but I have a book. It's called Not for Long, The Life and the Career of the NFL Athlete. And that was my dissertation. I went to school at the Cooney Graduate Center and my Ph.D. is in medical sociology. Um, and we'll kind of get to that a little bit later. But, um, you know, I just followed along in the crowd. I didn't know, even know how to choose a major. I, I didn't know at all. So I chose the major that almost all the other football players um, chose, and that was communications. And so I, you know, I really, again, through college, because of a lot of different things, I put a lot of limits on myself because I didn't really know how to, how to, um, you know, basically navigate the academic enterprise. So I was just left up to whatever was there. And, and for me, um, I went to college, not so much thinking about the education even. I went to college because I knew that college was the only path to go to the NFL. And that was my only dream as, as, a, as a young man. 
I, all I ever wanted to do was play in the NFL, right? And so I missed a lot of academic opportunities along the way, just simply because I was just really spending a lot more time being eligible than I was thinking about how do I make an academic career work for me along the way. Right. And of course, again, as I mentioned to you, my parents were happy. Right. They didn't go to college. They really didn't know. They couldn't advise me in anything. And, and so I had a major. I graduated in four years. In terms of everybody was concerned, I was a major success. Right. Um, and then I went on and um, because of I, got, I got actually had a really bad injury. Um, I broke my neck in college. Um, and so I missed half of my junior year, or almost all my junior year, but I was able to come back and play again after that. And then I played another four years in college. And I played during the time they had the old USFL, which they're resurrecting right now, which is the United States Football League. Um, so that I, I didn't uh, I didn't get go to the NFL right away. I went to the USFL. It gave me some time to let my my neck heal. So I missed a whole season and a half and then went on to play there. And then I went up to Canada and played a couple of years in the Canadian Football League. And then I um, had an opportunity to go down to the, to the San Francisco 49ers. And I played there briefly for less than a, about a quarter of a season. And then then before you know it, my career was done. But I, I would also say in kind of coming back full circle a little bit, the, the reason that Jay you wound up being a really good um, choice for me is because myself and six other guys in that small school had just started its football program all went to the NFL. So they did an incredible job bringing a bunch of talent together for us to be able to play ball. They did not exploit me academically, but I was exploited simply because like many first generation athletes or first generation folks that go to college, if you don't understand that enterprise, you're not making decisions that are that that necessarily may be the best for you long term unless you and so you mentors is probably the thing that I would focus on how important mentors are all across your career so I'll stop there I know I said a whole bunch of stuff right leading me up to getting to the NFL and my kind of background does anybody have questions about that part of my journey first before I continue to go on or does anyone have similar stories that you know, you had to overcome some of those academic challenges before you could get to where you are. So Dr. Turner, this is great. So before we go any further, uh, this is an interactive session, like you say, as a small group. I think it's only courteous to let the speaker see who he's talking to. That increases the dynamic. It's already bad enough that we can't be in person. So if you're not online, if you're not on camera, please come on. If for, if for some reason you don't wanna come on, you can join us at, at another session. But uh, the, the floor is open for questions and comments. The uh, hand raised from Dr. Andrew DePass. Can you please uh, come over and ask your question? Uh, not a doctor yet, hopeful doctor. Uh, but uh, actually sort of along those lines, uh, something that you said that uh, struck a chord with me was um, you let uh, or you let other people determine what your best was. So I was curious, how you broke out of that, how you realized that that was happening in the first place, how you broke out of that, and sort of how you judged, like, determining what your actual best was without, like, maybe overextending yourself. That's a really good question. I appreciate you asking that question. And, and it's kind of, you know, so we'll jump around from where we are now, right? So crazy enough, right? I Something that happened to me when I graduated from college that, really helped me better understand kind of the journey that I'm on. But it but it was crazy because I didn't really know this from before. So when I graduated from college, my my grandmother came down with my aunts and my uncles and everybody else. And my grandmother pulled me aside and she said she gave me a, a crisp brand new one hundred dollar bill. And she said to me, she said, I have been waiting my whole life for one of my children or my grandchildren to fulfill my dream of seeing you educate, educated and graduate from college, right? And so of course, now I had already finished. And so I, I, I didn't, when she mentioned that to me, cause my grandmother never told me any, I never knew how she felt and didn't know any of those things. But the moment that she told me that I, I said, you know what? Education must be really, really important, right? And I'm gonna honor my grandmother. I know that I'm eventually go back to school. Right. And so that's something that I knew I was going to do. But again, 
I didn't even know how, I, I didn't know how college worked. And <laughs> crazy enough, as part of my um, going to graduate school, like remember when I went to undergraduate, I never filled out an application for college. I never, I had to take SATs, but everybody does, for, for me as a football player and many of the division one type football players, people do all kinds of stuff for you, right? So I didn't have any idea. And so when it came time to go to graduate school, I didn't know what I wanted to study. I didn't know how you got into graduate school. I didn't know about an application for graduate school. I didn't know how to make a decision on what school you were gonna go to or anything else like that. Um, I just knew that I, I needed to go back because that was a way to honor my grandmother and, and, and you know, my, my four, parents prior to me you know bringing me to that point but i also knew that um that you know i was i just had a curious curious mind and i said started thinking about some things so when it came time to graduate go to graduate school i, I was working full time and i said well my criteria is that i'm not leaving new york city so I didn't apply to any colleges or any universities anywhere else. And I, I, I wound up taking sociology because I was just curious about a lot of things. But something happened to me that answered to answer your question. Um, when I and this is, goes back to mentors, there is a professor. I'll say his name. His name is uh, Dr. Juan Battle, who's at the Graduate Center, and um, he's a full professor. And so I took his class as a non-matriculating student. I didn't know how to get into school. Da 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 da. And so he mentored me through this process. And then I was so afraid to take the GRE because I didn't do good, well on the, the SATs and all sort of stuff. But I did a whole bunch of work to get myself, you know, kind of, uh, I guess you say, competitive. And so my scores had come out. And he asked me, he said, well, how did you do? And I, and I don't remember what the score, but I gave him the score and it was really good at that time. And he said something to me, cause I, I took his class, I got an A in the class, which was the first A I ever got in any kind of school whatsoever, any school. And he said, when I gave him my, my scores, he said, oh, so you're one of those intelligent black men, huh? And that was the first time it really struck me and that someone else saw that I was smart, right? And so therefore, I realize it's no shame to have academic deficiencies. There's lots of different reasons you have deficiencies, but it's what are you going to do in the situation that you are right now to where do you want to go? And so mentors are really important. How you see yourself is really, really important. And, 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 and this, if, if I don't give, if nobody in this, you know, here, if you don't walk away with anything else, please walk away with this one thing. And, and, and I'm talking to people who are highly successful and highly driven anyway, but share this with other people is never let anyone else dictate your path. Never let anyone else tell you who you are. You be the captain of that. You figure out what your strengths and your weaknesses are. You play to your strengths and you increase your, you know, you, you get stronger and smarter in, in your areas that you are deficient. Never let anybody else tell you that, right? Because I spent the whole first half of my life, I didn't go to graduate school until I was 40 years old, but I, I spent all of those years thinking I really wasn't that smart. It wasn't until someone else, you know, recognized me, pulled to, pulled me to the side, and said, "You have a tremendous amount of talent, skills, and abilities. Let's help cultivate them, you know, in you." And so that that's really kind of the answer. It wasn't until I was forty plus years old that I started to feel like I could actually do something you know, on an academic scholarly level, which is what I wasn't really trying to do that because truthfully, I had to be reprogrammed because all I ever really saw myself was from that early years was an athlete because that's how everybody else, you know, identified with me. And so it, I had to, again, graduate school allowed me to change the narrative. So any other questions on that? Well, I have a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, you suffered a broken neck, <laughs> yeah. which is like, uh, every time I think broken neck, I think nobody's going to walk again. So I'm <laughs> happy to see that you survived that. But um, had, did, did an injury in your career ever push you towards the idea or notion of going to medical school to study medicine? And have you ever experienced a defeatist mentality from a sports injury? injury? um no no on both accounts so like as a as a, again it wasn't 
an injury, it was my, it was a mental, it was a, it was like a social block that had blocked me from seeing myself in a certain way. Cause when I, I, um, I came to live in New York city after having finished my career, I lived in California for a long time and I was working, um, as a sales rep for a, com a computer company, a value added reseller for a computer company. And I was t talking to this, this brother and he said, you know, he, he got into medical school. He was going down to the Caribbeans. And he said, you know, you could go to medical school. And I, I looked at him like he had literally maybe four heads, not, not two, but four, because I was like, this guy doesn't know anything about me. He doesn't know my academic trajectory. He doesn't know where I came from. There's just literally no way that I could ever do this. And you know, you know, years later, I wind up becoming a medical sociology with advanced training in, you know, Alzheimer's disease research and um, health disparities research. I'm a gerontologist. Um, I, you know, study neuroscience, lots of different things, right? How did this all happen to me? I tell a lot of people, literally, maybe it was God that was knew my path, but it was not something that I was trying to do whatsoever. Um, I think I, I am the most blessed person around because I've been able to fulfill my dream of playing professional football, never thought that I would get a PhD, never thought that I would be in a medical school, never thought that I would get millions of dollars to craft the research that I really wanted to be able to do and focus on the community that I feel as though I can really help do translational research science. Um, so no, I never thought there was none of these things were ever barriers. My true barrier was just simply how I, my first exposure when someone labeled me as an early kid that I had a remedial problem and that never to expect much from me academically. That was my biggest hurdle. But once um, people started to show me that I could, you know, like, hey, you know, you do what you want to do. When I, when I, I re the same day that my mom gave, my grandmother gave me that hundred dollar bill, I remember my dad said something to the football coach that had recruited me. And it was the strangest thing that I had heard. I just could not understand why my dad would say something like this. It wasn't until years later, because you remember, because of my professional football career um, and other things, you know, I graduated college at what, 22 years old. I didn't go to graduate school until 40, right? So it was a long route and I did a whole lot of different things. But my dad, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget those two things from my graduation. But my dad said to the coach who recruited me, and, and I was the first class that this coach had recruited, and my, you know, they shook, shook hands, hugged each other and everything. And my dad said, you know, my son, now the world, he can do anything in this world that he wants to. He now can do anything. And I, I couldn't understand what that, why would he say that? I mean, all I had done was graduated from college. I, I never saw myself again because I felt like I had these limitations and da, da, da. And plus the fact that all I ever wanted to do was play football. So I didn't really understand that. It wasn't until after I got a PhD, right? People say, how does one go from, how do you go from playing professional football on a football scholarship to getting a PhD? We don't understand that. How do you write a book that's published from Oxford University Press? I was very fortunate enough that I made a, a, a documentary, documentary film with LeBron James and uh, Carter Maverick and uh, Maverick Carter and just a whole lot of other things that have really happened for me. They're like, how did that happen? I'm like, you know what? I just, you know, feel like I'm very blessed, but a lot of it is, is that I took the athletic mentality that I understand that you don't give up. Like you can push through and do anything you want, right? Things may be painful, but that's no reason to give up. And of course, I wanted to give up from getting a PhD. I was working full time and going to school full time, right? So that was really difficult. One of the things that pushed me through, two things pushed me through that program, right? And I remember saying to myself multiple times, you can't quit because you're Ruth Turner's grandson, right? So she helped me carry me through. But the other thing was, you know, my dad told me, hey, listen, you start anything you want. You just can't quit. You don't want to play so, season two? You just, fine. Say play season one, but you just can't quit. I said, well, I started this thing. I'm going to finish it. I have what it takes. And so I finished it. And through that you know, 
taught me that I have a whole lot of other skills. I have a whole lot of things that I can draw from that I never knew really existed because again, I was listening to and subjected to so much what was on the outside instead of really focusing on what had been invested inside of me. So can I, can I ask a question? Please. Uh, so um, do you think that um, the way the system labeled you from early on affected um, how you thought about yourself and how you were able to, um, you know, just uh, explore your potentials to, um, so, so in other words, you somewhat lock yourself down because of uh, that initial assessment by the system. You know, you think? Oh, absolutely, for sure, Dr. Gordon. Um, so th this again, may be one of the most fortuitous things that happened to me is I decided to get a PhD in sociology. And when I tell the story, a lot of people think, well, this is crazy, because it, it actually is kind of crazy. I mean, in a lot of respects, things kind of happened to me, but that I, I had no idea that they were all working together kind of for my good, right? So I never, the way that I wound up getting a PhD in sociology is that I was um, living in New York City. I happened to be working um, for this company and I went to go deliver a gift to a friend at one point. And they, you know, and it was in a, in a law office and they basically really belittled me like I was a delivery boy. And they told me I had to go around and and, and here I was, had a really good job work and, and I was making a lot of money. Um, and I just happened to not day not wear a suit. I had a day off, and so I went to go visit someone. And I and I and I was like, wow, this woman never even bothered to pay attention to me. This especially during a time where you know you had like the bike messengers run up and down New York City, da da da. And I said, man, here I am with a college degree, and they just going to treat me like this. I wonder what the heck, how do so many other brothers that are in this city just hustling, doing what they need to do, how are they getting stereotyped, labeled, and all of these different things? So Within that, I started doing a lot of reading, Cornell West and a lot of other people. And so this woman said to me, you want to go to graduate school, you need to go study sociology. And, and, and she, I know what she said is you need to go and study race in college. And I said, you can actually do that. And she said, yeah, it's called sociology. Now, here I was at that point, I was probably 39 years old. I had never heard of the word sociology. I had been reading a sociologist's writings, but I never knew, never even knew the word. I didn't know it was a discipline. I had no idea. So I said, okay, I'm going to go and pursue that. I tell that story because what happened while I was in school, um, and I remember I was working full time at the same time, and I was a, um, I was the director of a sports mar uh, marketing agency. And one of my professors said, the best way to get through this class and that will help you get through the school is to study what you know. And I was like, well, I know athletes. I was an athlete, I understand that. So I just threw myself into a lot of reading. And then I realized when it came to how black men are educated in this country, and when I understand that has race relations, I understand again, exploitation through athletes and all of this other stuff. I started realizing that I was reading my own life story and in, in the books that and the theories and, and the, the rate, the examinations that were going there, that's what unshackled me. Once I realized that what brought me to the place of and how I was thinking about myself, that unshackled me. That also meant that once I was clear about that, that I had power at that point to keep other people from labeling me or keeping me down. Right. So that freedom is really is going back to what my dad had said and that now I can do anything that I want to. We have a question from Jordan. Jordan, can you come off mute and ask your question? Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I asked, like, did you get into communication, like sports communications, like after you played in the USFL or was that something you were going to do regardless of whether or not you played in the major leagues? That's funny that you asked that. Again, I have to take you back to the point that I didn't have a plan when I when I decided to become take a degree in communication. I just took the communications because we were sitting around in the locker room and a lot of guys were saying I'm I'm a communications major. So I became a communications major too because I figured we could go and and cheat off of each other. We can go and kind of help each other graduate through school. Some of them did, you know, radio, TV, film. I did more like speech communication, which oddly enough really 
helps me a great deal because I get a lot of talks. I do a lot of talks when I was after, after I finished playing professional football, I went into sales because I guess I'm a natural salesperson. I'm more extroverted that way. So it was a lot about, again, a skill that I was able to develop with that degree that helps me here. But it certainly wasn't, it wasn't, a, there wasn't a plan. <laughs> it didn't happen in a way that I know that I could draw on this later. So many different things happened to me in my life that were very fortuitous. Maybe it's because I have the ability to, um, to draw all kinds of experiences together and, and try to figure out since I can, I've had this, I can do this. I don't really know, but it has helped me. All of these different things has helped me along the way to be able to be sitting here and talking to you about my journey. Next, we'd like to go to uh, our SWAG consortium partner out of Princeton. <laughs> Jess, can you please come off from you and ask your question? Sure. Hi, Dr. Turner, and thank you so much. This is so great to hear from you. Um, I wanted to ask whether, and I work with a lot of, I do student athlete um, advising, and I used to be a pre-med advisor. So I work with a lot of students who um, struggle a lot with people who define them as just an athlete. Um, and a lot of the work that, that I do is recognizing that, first of all, that you are more than an athlete. Um, and also being an athlete means that you have a lot of skills and experience and um, that, that will come into play in really meaningful, maybe even more meaningful ways than organic chemistry. Um, and so I'm just wondering whether you feel like the systems um, are changing to recognize those experiences so that, um, so that athletes are are recognized and valued for the things that they bring in addition to the academic potential um i I, I take your question first of all thank you i take your question in kind of two parts but i'm gonna the very end i'm gonna start with first do i think that systems are changing no i don't think they're changing uh, i think that there's bias built into the system that we live in whether that bias is against you know, um, women or, or people of transgender or people who are black or uh, there's always some kind of biases built into that that we're going to continue to have to struggle through. Right. That's number one. Um, and number two, just to answer another part of your question is that the, the being identified as an athlete was something that um, I struggled with for a long, long time for what you know, I mean, there's nothing worse in your athletic career than being an ex-athlete, right? Because people don't walk away more, more than likely, they don't walk away because they realize it was time. They they walked away because they were pushed out of it. No matter, especially the higher level you go, you get pushed out of this thing. And you have this love for the game, right? They're like in, in my instance, football, you don't strap on a football helmet after you finish playing and you've been out of the game for so many years. That's a young person sport. It is not for us who are old. Now you can go out there and play basketball and you know throw the ball around, throw slow ball, slow ball pitch and all of that other stuff. But by and large, you know, we all long for and remember, you know, very kind of like um romantically about the days that we played, right? But, you know, when I got finished playing, particularly for me, you know, I, I think I was 27, 28 years old, and I still had a I had the body of a football, a professional football player. So people would walk up to me all the time and they'd be like, man, how come you don't play football? Or I saw you, you know, last week, I literally, or last season, I saw you playing in the NFL. What happened? How come you're not there? You, that that is demoralizing to have to continue to to answer that and then what's even worse for me is once i went into working in corporate america for a little while people find out that you play professional football so literally i had a couple of companies hire me and that's all they would do is they would say oh this is robert he played xyz right and so breaking out of that identity that other people want to put that label on you is really really difficult and ironically, I didn't actually break out of it until after I finished graduate school. But the way I broke out of it was actually through sports because I, you know, my dissertation wound up becoming um, an examination on why do so many athletes um, really have a difficult time in their transition, their transition to life after sports, right? But then that put me on a trajectory 
to start understanding things about mental health, depression, those kinds of issues, and then combining that to where I landed, and that is looking at brain injury and brain health, right? So which is encompasses mental health and all of those other things. And so now it, you know, people look at me as a research scientist or any other way that I want to define myself and part of the population that I study is our um. Uh, you know, football players, but I really say that I, I study black men's brain aging, right? So it wasn't, it was, it was a thing that actually I had to go through that actually you know, freed me from being that way. So I would say this to especially people in college or anything else like that. People can only label you if you give them the power to label you, you have to take that back. You have to be someone that says, okay, listen, and I tell my nephew right now, my nephew is in on his way, hopefully to getting drafted into the NFL. And, and what I say to him is, you know what, there are there are other ways that you can go about positioning other how other people see you. So like I'm encouraging him to write a children's book. Right. So he starts right off. Here he is in the NFL as a you know 22 year old. But if he has a children's book, people are going to want to talk to him about his book, not about him being in the NFL. So there are things that you have to be able to do to position yourself to take control and be owned over that, over, over where you want to go and what you want to do. I would like to go to Kian. Also, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I, I think you pretty much uh, answered my question, Dr. Turner, but I'll just pose it again, just in case you had anything else to add. But first of all, thank you for hopping on this call with us and sharing your story. I'll introduce myself. My name is Keanu Carbon, recently graduated from Baruch College, which is also in the CUNY system. All right. I'm currently, a, <laughs> I'm currently at Twitter doing marketing as well. And I wanted to just uh, touch a little bit on personal branding. Uh, moving from, you know, playing college football to professional football to writing a book and, you know, creating a documentary, I wanted to just um, ask about a few things you may have picked up on the way um, that you may have learned, of, of course, uh, when talking about personal branding, because I know for each of those roles that you've played and these experiences you had throughout your life, um, they 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 hold a lot on exactly who you are your identity who you spoke of what you as you spoke of a moment ago and also your personal brand so i just wanted your thoughts on that sure you asked a really interesting question because i grew up at a time where there was no such thing as personal branding <laughs> i never heard of anything like that before we didn't have those we literally we didn't we didn't we were not like the internet gives you a lot more control of how people see you and some people use it in a very smart way and then some people use it in a ridiculously bad way right because what's put out on the internet stays out on the internet right so you know having a personal brand is something that all of us have to um think about now whereas before we never really did have to think about that but but i i think in terms of when i think about branding and when i think about you know younger people and people wanting to come up um i i think about um you know who is it what do you how how do you see yourself what do you want to accomplish what do you how do you want other people to really think about you um and you know as i'm saying that as as someone that has a developed you know career but when i when i mentor young people in my my lab in particular I'm really asking them, I, I think mentorship is really the key. That's one of the things I always go back to is who do you want to be? Who do you know that's there? Um, who can be a guidepost for you? Who is? Who are you making yourself available that can invest themselves into you? Right. And, and I think that that is completely invaluable. Whenever people come to work in my lab, one of the things I tell them right up front, I, I say, basically, we have a contract together. What is it that you're looking to accomplish? Why do you want to be here? Right. And have a very clear understanding of what it is that you want to accomplish. Write it down and express it to me and make sure that you really understand it. And we're going to check in with each other a couple of times throughout the, the course of this semester, because at the end of the semester, I want to know, did you get out of this experience and this opportunity what it is that you're looking for? Because obviously, I, I feel like you're bright. I feel like you can contribute. I feel like the lab is going to benefit greatly from this. But I look for a symbiotic relationship. How 
can I help you get to where you're going as I help you know, my lab as to where it needs to go? When I force young people to think about those things, it helps them understand what their brand is. It helps them understand who they're shaping themselves to be. It helps them understand where they're trying to get to because nothing happens by happenstance. And it's so competitive. Those of you who are in medical school, you know how competitive it is. It's competitive along the way, right? So, you know, when I think about brands, I, I always think about like, how do you see yourself? How do you, what do you consider success? Being mindful of that and cutting out a path, a clear path along the way. And, you know, there's going to be all kinds of things that throw you off the path and that's fine. But mentors are there to help you and recognizing that, you know, you have to be flexible and that, you know, you, you know, you, you win by staying in the game. It's not about you know, was I successful at this and not successful at that? As long as you remain in the game, you got a chance to win. Thank you. Thank you for that word. I see uh, Dr. Cohen has his hand up. Thank you there, Anthony. And uh, thank you there, Dr. Turner, for sharing these words of wisdom. Um, really beneficial as we try to, you know, navigate the path. I just wonder, I always like to ask folks, you know, what's been your, what's been your greatest strategy or survival technique in navigating you know the racism that you experienced on the, up the food chain because you, you come all the way up to the path you know just just for brothers out there just trying to you know navigate that path as well just trying to find a strategy what's been your greatest technique that you've been able to use or just actually always just foster when you get into that storm what, what are you doing well, I'm gonna go back to I'm gonna give you another layer of it, but but I have personally found that mentors are like just really important. I was taught by um, Dr. Robert Taylor, who is in the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan. He said something after I actually I, I heard this after I graduated, but it has and then I go back and look throughout my whole life and recognize that this is kind of how my life has been like. So he said that, you know, you need to have multiple um, mentors in your life. You need to have, and the way he said it, anywhere from five to seven mentors, because no one mentor or no two mentors are going to serve every area of your life. Sometimes you're going to need a mentor in academia where you can just literally go and cry on that person's shoulder. Just cry right someone that's going to kick you in the butt and say okay we finished hearing you cry now what are you going to do about it there are people who need to be contact and there's people that need to tell you how to you know career training there's people who need to tell you how to you know navigate um to what are the missing gaps on your cv all these different things right and 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 the reason i say that this has been kind of in my life the whole time because my 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 biggest mentor in my whole life has been my dad Right. You know, I, I come from a very strong family. As you've heard, my mom and dad have been together, my grandparents and everything else. But, you know, my dad's been my champion. My dad's been a person that I could always go and talk to. And that has helped me like Juan Battle. Other people have helped me to recognize that, you know what, you can't do it all by yourself. No, my dad used to say, no man is an island unto himself, no person island unto himself, right? We need people, we're social beings. So make, you know, figure out like people who are in your life that are holding you down, just get rid of them. People in your life who have a vested interest in caring about you. I guarantee you, as you know, Dr. Cohen, no matter what you go through in academia, medical, anything, somebody else before you has traveled that path. Somebody else has been through that and that they're willing to pass that wisdom on to you. You just got to find those people. So instead of worrying about the problem that's right up in front of you, find those people who, when you're too tired, they'll carry you. Find those people who will pave a way for you. Find those people who will say right behind you and say, hey, man, I saw what you just did. I want to follow you. So me, I really believe in peer mentoring. I believe in mentoring younger folks and I believe in being mentored, right? Because that helps us recognize that we're not in this game alone. Appreciate it, Doug. No Thank problem. You, uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Anybody want to come off mute? Anybody want to raise their hand as we start? So, so, so Dr. Turner, um, in a few minutes we have left, can you tell us, tell the group a little bit about your research you, you commented about it a few times but just give them kind of a brief overview of the type of research you're doing in your area of focus great thank you for that question so you saw us um i've put some websites on the uh in the chat 
And so I am um, what I call an, um, you know, a biobehavioral um, neurocognitive researcher. I look at um, I, I look at kind of the neuro the neurocognitive and psychosocial factors around um, accelerated cognitive aging, particularly in brain injury around you know concussions and the relationships to that in in um, with Alzheimer's disease. And then a second strand of my work is looking at Alzheimer's um, caregiving, right? So my particular focus is I look at black men's brain, right? Black men's brain aging, right? And so I kind of figured out a way, fortunately, how to bring all of those things together in this, um, this black male um, brain health conference. You'll see the, um, you'll see the, uh, the URL for that. And what we've done is been able to get an R13 grant from the National Institute of Aging, which I also have a K01 Early Career Development Award. So I've received training in doing health disparities research. Um, and I was trained specifically in the beginning of my career as an ethnographer with qualitative research, but I needed to training to be able to do mixed method research, uh, survey research development, um, all kinds of things that allows me for my K01 award. What I look at is I look at um, we do uh, cogn neurocognitive assessments. Just look at your uh, your cognitive functioning. We also do some uh, blood draw. We do um, get urine samples. We do MRIs, and then um, we do a whole health history for those. And we're looking at the kind of the psychosocial and neurocognitive dimensions um, and how. Um, how they differ between um, what we say is the people that have high exposure to concussions, people who have mid um, medium exposure over their careers to concussions, and then those people who have low careers. So what we do is our comparison group or our control group is um, men who have played division one um, sports, non-contact sports, and then we look at their kind of their uh, neurocognitive outcomes and their overall health outcomes uh, and the way that they think about their health and kind of their social behavior or health. And then we look at former college football players um, and measure them and compare them against a comparison group. And then so they they've they've had the medium exposure to um, head injury and concussion. And then we have the high exposure and that is former uh, NFL athletes. So that, that allows me to do one strain of work. And then, I, of course, I have the caregiver work. But what we found was that, you know, we have a, you know, a real issue. Um, and my work is really kind of predicated on this idea that um, people from underrepresented, you know, backgrounds, communities, we are underrepresented in biomedical research, right? And then we also know that black men have, you know, we, we are so tired of hearing it, especially as black men, we are at the biggest risk factors for this. We're at this, we're at the bottom of all health, in, you know, indexes, right? So what we said was we need to do two things. We need to do basically three things and this conference allows this to happen. And this is really kind of what I'm trying to build an institute around, but we need to disseminate information to the community. So that's one, that's really important, right? The other part that's really, really important is we need to get black men to be involved in research, right? So we have a brand health registry that we're, we're disseminating information from, we're building relationships, we're teaching people about how to be involved in the community, community advisory boards for research and everything. But we want to build up and really advocate for recruiting Black men to be in our brain health registry and then what it takes to retain them, not in the way traditional retaining in like clinical trials, but retaining them in this so that way they remain very active participants in the uh, registry. And then the last thing that we do, and I feel really excited about, and I would love to invite others that are involved with this group, but we have an emerging scholars program. Right. And for us, emerging scholars means anyone who's in graduate school, post um, postgraduate, you know, uh, postdoc or medical or anything else like that, um, all the way up through assistant and associate professors. And because what we felt was and we've heard lots of people say that, you know what, 
I want to, I feel more comfortable doing research. I feel more comfortable going to a doctor. I feel clinical and everything else with someone who looks like me. And so this is one of the things we know that particularly say, for instance, in football, at least we have an open representation of black men that play football. So we want to recruit those men and get them involved in, you know, getting PhDs, being in the healthcare system, being, you know, doctors or anywhere along that way. Right. Um, but, but our emerging scholars program is open to anyone who wants to do brain health research and we engage people in the community. So in our first cohort uh, of nine people, I think we have um, six African-American men, um, one white male and two females, two African-American females that are in black females in there. And people always say, well, you know, it's a pipeline problem. We can't find enough. Well, with our program, we found plenty of people. We have some people who are biomedical. We have people who are MDs. We have PhDs. There were, and every one of them to a person said, you know, this is the very first time that I saw a program that I didn't even know you could study brain health. And you're giving me an opportunity. It's run by a person that looks like me. And you're allowing me to be, you know, developed so I can go do this work, right? So we have neuropsychologists and all these other people in there. Our program allows us to have um, recruit over the next two years, we're going to recruit 20 more people, right? So each cohort will have, the next cohort I'll have 11 and then the one after that I'll have 10. So our hope is that, you know, and our goal is, again, getting community members, community, we're taking a community-based participatory research approach and doing culturally competent work because we know that there are a lot of people who are out on the front lines living that reality in the community every day. We need them as part of the research enterprise. They need to tell us what needs to be studied in the community so we can work together so we can get more folks of color into these studies answering the kinds of questions, disseminating the kind of information that we need to make our communities healthier. So that's that's kind of a broad overview of what I do with my studies and what we're doing with this, um, the conference that we really look forward to turning into a center as a resource for people like yourself who want to be part of the enterprise. As a quick follow-up, can you just tell the group what the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is in the black population compared to general population? Well, that's a great question. And I'm gonna focus on it this way, right? Because we know that the, the prevalence and the incidence is much higher amongst uh, the black community than it is um, in the regular community, right? Or in the, across other communities or the general population, the number is quite high for us. But as Dr. Carl Hill, who is the DEI, um, um, director for uh, the Alzheimer's Association. I've heard two stats over the last weeks that really blow my mind away. He said, one, we really can't trust the numbers um, in Alzheimer's because of all of the studies for Alzheimer's um, participant, participation among Blacks is about 5%. So he says, so it's very likely that it's way under um, counted under representation based on what we know, well under, right? That's number one. And then I was on um, a call yesterday with a um, with someone that does um, like uh, biological research. And what she went on to tell me, she said, of all clinical trials, not just for dementia, but of all clinical trials, the participation for blacks is a, anywhere from one to three percent, which means that like we know that the latest drug for um, for Alzheimer's Association, when Biogen uh, actually released the numbers, there was only 3% participation of Blacks in that. So we don't know how that drug truly works with, with Black folks, right? So we are, this is a, you know, so what I would say is this, dollars out of NIH that are, that are really committed to um, addressing health issues around our country, we're not at the table pushing the agenda or helping those decisions being made, right? On, on every level, because we're not in the room, we're not in the studies, we're not directing the research or the, or the funding or the funding. This is a big problem that we have. And I hope that what I do is just a way to get people aware and start to getting them engaged because it, you know, our country is only gonna become more and more racially and ethnically diverse. Right. So we need to be part of all that it takes to control the health in our community. 
Great way to end, Anthony. <laughs> well, so thank you, Dr. Turner, for coming out and giving us your knowledge. Thank you, everybody, for joining the call. Look forward to seeing you on future events. Uh, the next one is next month. And we have Dr. Um, Blevins, who is a uh, coach on the New York Giants. He's agreed to speak, so that'll be a great turnout. So thank you all for coming out. Have a great night. God bless. Get home safe. Thank you all. Thank Appreciate you. you having me. Good. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Have a good night. Thank you.